Assalamu alaikum everyone. I welcome you all to the fourth session of the 18th Endocrine, Pakistan Endocrine Society DigiCon 2020. I'm Dr. Rouj Lal Rahman, Assistant Professor of Endocrinology at Jinnah Postgraduate Medical Center, Karanchi, and I will be moderating this session today. This exciting session is all about reproductive endocrinology. The topic is where an endocrinologist can help. We are graced by presence of some esteemed endocrinologists as our chairs and panelists. First of all, I would like to introduce my chair of this session, Professor Amrita Sneem Essen. She was professor and head of Department of Medicine at Jinnah Postgraduate Medical Center, elected as Professor Amrita in uh, JPMC in 2016, founder member of Pakistan Endocrine Society and Medicine and Endocrine Foundation. Established Medicine Institute of Diabetes, Endocrinology and Metabolism, MIDEM, in 2017. Secretary Faculty of Endocrinology at College of Physicians and Surgeons of Pakistan. Member of Higher Education Commission Board on Biological and Health Sciences. Now coming to our four panelists. First is Professor Dr. H. Amir. He's in charge and head of services department of diabetes, endocrinology, and metabolic diseases at Khyber Girls Medical College, Hyderabad Medical Complex, Peshawar, Pakistan. He's immediate past president American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, past president of Pakistan Endocrine Society, vice president South Asian Federation of Endocrine Societies, chairman task force diabetes executive committee KPK, executive member national task force for diabetes and project director extension detox and insulin for life project government of kpk coming to the second panelist professor khushid khan professor khushid khan is president of pakistan endocrine society and professor of medicine and endocrinology head of department of medicine and at allied fatma memorial medical and dental college lahore He's consultant doctor at Doctors Hospital and Medical Center. The third panelist is Dr. Tabindar Ugal. She is consultant in diabetes and endocrinology at uh, Royal Cornwall Hospital, Truro Cornwall. And she has special interests in women's endocrine health, gender endocrinology, obesity, and complex diabetes. She has done fellowship from Royal College of Physicians in Ireland and is trained in St. George Hospital, uh, London with CCT in endocrine and diabetes. Fourth, but not last, but not least, Dr. Musarra Triaz. Uh, she's assistant professor and consultant endocrinologist at Pakai Institute of Diabetes and Diabetology, Diabetes and Endocrinology. She has more than 35 peer reviewed international and national publications, including book chapters contributed in, in latest IDF Atlas 2019 in the chapter regarding hyperglycemia and pregnancy. Main area of interest is women health, including gestational diabetes and polycystic ovaries. Now I will uh, give the dice to Dr. Tasneem Essen, the rest of the proceedings to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roach. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, First of all, I want to thank the eminent speakers for this session, as well as the eminent panelists who have taken time out on a, on a weekend to be with us uh, in this session on uh, gynecological uh, uh, reproductive endocrinology. Um, it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce this first speaker uh, of the session, Dr. Richard Quinton who is a consultant endocrinologist at Newcastle on Tyne Hospitals. He's a senior lecturer, translational and clinical research institute, University of Newcastle on Tyne. He's the treasurer, European Union of Medical Specialties, Specialists. He's a member of exam board and standard setting committees for UK specialty certifying exam in diabetes and endocrinology and European board exam in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism. His research interest is particularly in clinical and genetic aspects of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So may I now request Dr. Richard Quinton to deliver his talk in optimizing hormone replacement therapy in men and women in the next 25 minutes. This is another area of 
endocrinology where there is a lot of work that needs to be done to clarify the mist. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Richard Quinton. Many, many thanks. Now, let me see. I will try and share the screen now. Uh, so let me be able to share. Yes. Share. Okay. Hopefully that's uh, that's in now, and you can all share the uh, see, see, see the screen. Yep. Okay. So many thanks for the invitation. It's a privilege to be invited by you. I have very fond memories of coming to Islamabad for PS in 2016, and I do hope one day I may return in person to Pakistan. So. I'll briefly, I'm going to start off with testosterone in men and move on to estrogen in women. Um, that, that order wasn't intentional. Um, but I thought maybe if I'm going to wind up the OBGYNs, I'll, I'll leave it until the end. So testosterone, biological actions. Uh, firstly, a lot of them aren't actually mediated by testosterone. They're mediated by conversion to estradiol. Many actions we think due to testosterone actually uh, result from its conversion to estradiol such as effect to improve trabecular bone density and closure of epiphyses, uh, feedback inhibition of GnRH and gonotropin secretion. Uh, interestingly, fluid retention with excessive doses of testosterone. We see that uh, men who are bodybuilders who abuse testosterone and get fluid retention find, take aromatase inhibitors to, to mitigate their edema. Um, then there are the estrogen independent actions. This is pure testosterone or, or dihydrotestosterone effect hematopoiesis, myoblast differentiation to muscle, effects on body and scalp hair, external genital development, and bone length and bone cortical thickness. Um, and then effects that require both the testosterone direct effect um, and also the estrogen action, uh, libido and spermogenesis. Uh, sometimes we actually um, uh, measure an SHBG level, sex hormone and globulin to calculate free testosterone and why might we want to do that, even though total testosterone is, is our mainstay test? Well, there are certain states that are very high, high in SHBG, which will tend to lower free testosterone, and certain situations that are low SHBG states, and that will tend to uh, raise uh, free testosterone compared to total. So how does hypogonadism present across the male lifespan? Well, uh, obviously, if the onset's in utero, then you may present with as uh, ambiguous genitalia as a 46XY disorder of sexual development. Um, after at birth, you may present with bilateral cryptorchidism with or without micropenis. In childhood, with delayed, absent or arrested puberty. In um, adult life, with sexual dysfunction or infertility. Uh, as you get older, loss of segment sexual characteristics. Uh, and finally, in old age, premature osteoporosis, anemia and myopathy. And this is what you look like in terms of your skin if you get to age uh, 67 as a man with Kalman syndrome, 68, uh, never been uh, treated. And you see the characteristic wrinkly skin that you would otherwise only tend to see in postmenopausal women. So he is the oldest patient we've ever taken through puberty de novo uh, with testosterone at age 68. Where will you find hypogonadal men? Not necessarily what you think. So yes, some of them will be, you'll find them coming to you with sexual dysfunction and fatigue. Some will come from pediatrics. Increasingly, there'll be childhood cancer survivors, radiotherapy to the brain or testes, or having had alkaline chemotherapy. Also increasingly from fertility clinics, men presenting with azospermia. Survivors of testicular cancer, particularly those who've been orchidectomized unilaterally or, or, or bilaterally. Those who've had skull base or pituitary surgery or radiotherapy. And we mustn't forget Kleinfelter syndrome, which is one in 600 male neonates. And then increasingly, we need to be looking at our older men presenting with osteoporosis uh, and fracture, and also with anemia and frailty. So this is a statue of the National Gallery in London, just to illustrate some key differences between men and women. So uh, this little child thing there has got a hemoglobin of 105 to 155. Uh, and then Venus here has a very similar hemoglobin and hematocrit, but Mars has a much higher hemoglobin and hematocrit. And uh, the reason for that is entirely due to the effect of testosterone. 
So testosterone stimulates red cell production, bone marrow, we know that. We're not quite sure how, remarkably. There may be a direct action on bone marrow. It may act indirectly via increased EPO secretion or increased sensitivity to EPO. There may be also a mechanism related to hepcidin. We know that states of testosterone deficiency are associated with having a lower hemoglobin and hematocrit, such as hypogonadism, childhood, being female. And we know that too much testosterone will tend to cause erythrocytosis or polycythemia, which is why Lance Armstrong here had to venesect himself uh, quite regularly. And so what is the risk of erythrocytosis and polycythemia? Well, we, have, we know very little about if it's due to androgens themselves, but we do know what the population risk is. Um, and so we do know that if you have a, a high hematocrit um, compared to the middle 50th, middle half of the centiles of population, if you're in the top 5% of population for hematocrit, uh, you have a 50% increased risk of myocardial infarction. And there's no reason to suppose that having a high hematocrit due to too much testosterone uh, will have any less worrying effect. Um, but on the good news, uh, this was from the, the T trials run by, uh, runs, um, by Professor Schneider. Um, I'm not sure these men were ever actually truly hypogonadal. They were rather older or obese men, um, a lot of them with type diabetes who had slightly low testosterone level. But anyhow, uh, they found that a third of older men have unexplained anemia. Um, and amongst these older men with, with anemia, actually, um, whether you thought you knew the cause of anemia or not, um, so explained, or whether you didn't know the cause of anemia, actually giving testosterone made a significant, giving testosterone made a significant improvement in the hemoglobin and hematocrit. That's a very useful finding, provided you don't go too far. Um, the two trials also showed a beneficial effect uh, on bone. This slide actually is from one of my patients uh, who presented with Calvin syndrome, undiagnosed, untreated, absent puberty, age 57. And here we can see this remarkable effect of um, a testosterone in middle to old age uh, on this man, absolutely much more powerful than you'd achieve with any uh, bone uh, protective or, or anabolic uh, drug. Uh, his bone density is now effectively normal range. Um, going back to the T trials, uh, again, these older, overweight men, slightly low testosterone. The effect on sexual function was pretty meager, a little better than Viagra, and the effect really wasn't sustained much more than a year. Physical function trial, not much difference there. Vitality, not much difference. Uh, although there was a slightly worrying signal in respect to um, non-calcified coronary atheroma. So I think what this illustrates is that testosterone is a great treatment if you have uh, organic hypogonadism. Uh, it's not a great treatment to toss out to um, uh, older men without a, val a verified diagnosis of hypogonadism um, who have a slightly low testosterone level, whether due to obesity or frailty. So how do we give testosterone? Um, well, the classics are your uh, short-acting um, uh, injections, enanthate, propionate, or the combined sustenon. Um, and uh, in fact, motivated patients can even self-inject. Very cheap, but uh, giving it the conventional IM way, there's a marked variation between peak and trough levels. So conventionally, we suggest only checking blood at the pre-injection trough. And so potentially the patient might spend maybe about a third of the time with testosterone in normal range, the rest of the time above or below if you're injecting uh, every three weeks. Also transdermal gels, um, well absorbed, obviously more expensive, you need to let them dry properly, uh, less good with hairy skin, make sure there's no contact with carers or partners, especially be careful with sharing beds with children. Um, and the pump dispensers, sachets or tubes. But I'm told these are less successful in tropical climates so they tend to stay tacky. Uh, and you get pretty stable physiological levels just with the daily application. We also have in the last uh, decade or so, the long acting intramuscular testosterone, the uh, Nibido. Um, so it's quite a large volume, very thick, very gloopy. Uh, important that you warm the ampule first, inject it as a slow push of one to two minutes with the, with the blue needle. Um, some patients will get a paroxysmal cough or dyspnea, which might be related to liver embolism, we don't know, uh, but um, uh, it's recommended that they be watched for about 15 minutes afterwards. Give your first two doses two months apart, wait three months, 
from the second to the third. Check the blood test with the third injection, and that'll tell you what the time to the fourth and fifth are. Um, there is some accumulation between doses, so it may take you about two to three years of adjusting the injection interval according to trough bloods uh, to get to a stable injection interval. Um, we have some patients who are literally on it uh, twice a year. And if you kept banging into them every 12 weeks, they would definitely develop polycythemia. Some patients have complained of a little bit of a dip in sexual function before the last inject, before the next injection. But you know what? You have to listen to the hemoglobin and hematocrit uh, first. You have to prioritize that over these symptoms. And you can see here, comparing the first injection to the 13th injection, you can see how there's um, uh, some uh, accumulation. Um, of all those previous uh, injections. Uh, now, in fact, a new, since a new kid on the block is actually giving the, the, the short acting uh, um, injectables, but subcutaneously rather than intramuscularly. And these actually give a rather nicer subcutaneous pharmacokinetic profile, better than the classic IM route. So that may be the way forward. Um, and an interesting, the first reference, this was actually all things the Saudi Medical Journal, 2006. Unfortunately, not many people read it. Um, men with secondary hypogonadism with pituitary disease, you can also treat them with HCG, around two to seven and a half thousand IU units, IU subcut in a week, typically split into two to three doses. It's cheaper than testosterone gels or libido. You get stable testosterone levels, but you must mon also monitor the estradiol level. If that begins to climb, you have to reduce the dose or you put them at risk of developing uh, gynecomastia. The advantage of this is that it won't suppress the sperm count for many who are desiring fertility. If you really want to improve the sperm count, you can also add FSH as well. So risks and benefits, optimal monitoring. So the real risk, the one we have to really have to worry about is erythrocytosis and thrombosis risk. It may also exacerbate benign prostatic hypertrophy. It may also unmask occult prostate cancer. Other things that are described in textbooks, but really are not convincingly described and probably relate to urban myth, are induction of a de novo aggressive prostate cancer, personality change, aggression, hypersexuality, and liver disease. Priorities of monitoring therapy, yep. Full blood count, full blood count, full blood count. You monitor that, most things look after themselves. All the guidelines say you need to aim for a low end testosterone level at trough or a mid range serum level if you're on a gel, but actually that's all other things being equal. Doesn't matter if your testosterone level is, is, is within range. If the patient's developing erythrocytosis, you have to back off and reduce the dose and accept a lower T level. Conversely, if you're looking after a younger man with low bone density, actually, provided the serum, the, the blood count is fine, you can push the testosterone level higher than the, the mid range. The bones will thank you for that. Worth checking Bernetzi every three to five years. There is some controversy about what prostate safety measures should be should be undertaken. Um, and because um, effectively we're screening these men for PSA, even though there's no data in the general population. Um, so I think opposition don't, don't suggest a major effect on prostate cancer risk. Um, and we just suggest a PSA at baseline and after six to 12 months, Thereafter, check every one to three years, depending on initial levels and the gradient of rise. Uh, I'm not sure there's a role for digital rectal examination, I have to say, particularly in people who don't do them very often, as it's less sensitive than the PSA level. Okay, on to women now. And this is where I'm hoping to um, uh, stir things up a little bit with my OBGYN colleagues. So what do the guidelines tell us? And are they telling us the truth? Sexual replacement in young hypogonadal women. So are the guidelines, are these guidelines evidence-based and do they make logical sense? What HD products are available? How do they differ? And are the transfer lessons from HRT in men to this gene, what we've called trans men? And I'll try and put to your rationale for titrated estradiol replacement rather than giving blind treatment with a random dose of uh, female HRT. And bring up also the significance of uterine measurements in young hypergonadal women from sonography. So what's the purpose of sexual replacement in a younger woman? Well, to achieve and maintain adequate bone density and to reduce fracture risk in later life to baseline, to permit normal sexual functioning. 
I promise you that if sex remotely uncomfortable for us men, humanity would die out very quickly. We would simply stop doing it. To eliminate vasomotor symptoms, to reduce the long-term cardiovascular risk to baseline, to achieve breast development in those who have it congenitally, according to genetic potential, and also a new concept to achieve uterine development according to genetic potential in those young women with congenital hypogonadism, Kalman's or Turner's gonadal genesis. So what do the guidelines say? So this, these are, I picked up the worst ones first. These are the ones from the American hypertrichism guidelines. Hypertrich women on all will require high doses of growth hormone. Yep, but frankly, who cares? The combined oral contraceptive pill may be more acceptable for younger females, for which actually the, the evidence of that is zero. No one has ever said that. No patient has ever said that to me. So I'm not sure why that's in there. Studies comparing these two regimens are lacking. Actually, no, the studies are not lacking. They are there and they show that HRT is better. Estrogen is available in many forms, oral, transdermal, intergenital creams, tablets and rings, according to patient preference. And this just really shows just how the authors of the Pichucci American guidelines knew nothing about female HRT. Because of course, intervaginal creams, tablets and rings, that's just female Viagra. That's to make sex less uncomfortable. None of that will be absorbed systemically. That is not a form of HRT. Measuring serenestrodial levels is not beneficial, actually. Uh, there's no evidence for that whatsoever. And I will present you some data to show actually it is potentially very beneficial. Moreover, some estrogens are not detected by the assays. Well, the ones that aren't the synthetic ones in the combined oral contraceptive pill, um, natural estrogens are detected in the assays. Uh, and again, I will put forward a suggestion why we should be using natural estrogens and not the combined oral contraceptive pill. What about UK guidance, National Institute of Health? Well, at least it's brief. One sentence. Women with premature insufficiency are offered HRT or a combined hormone contraceptive. And that's it. Slightly more sophisticated, the European consensus statement on congenital hypoc hypoc, including Kalman's. Estradiol is given orally or transdermally with cyclic progestin. So that, that's actually making more sense. Um, what I would take um, up with are the doses suggested, which actually are way too low for a young hypogonadal woman uh, in terms of the plasma levels you might achieve. So what estrogens are there out there? Well, 70 beta estradiol is your dominant circulating estrogen in premenopause. We also have Premarin, which is, comes from pregnant mare's urine. They're cathetered, by the way, so you wouldn't see them spurt that way. Is the pregnant mares catheterized. Uh, we know from data in postmenopause women and particularly in trans women that is associated with a greatly increased risk of venous thrombomalism compared with as plain estradiol. We also have ethanol estradiol, which is present in almost all combined oral contraceptive pills, uh, which is associated likewise with an increased risk of venous thrombomalism um, in um, women taking the pill uh, and also it's associated with a hugely increased risk of um, thrombomalism in trans women. It's also associated with doubling risk of cardiovascular death in trans women, so women who were born as males. Uh, it increased the blood pressure by activating renin, something that, that natural estradiol doesn't do. It's also a powerful inhibitor of growth hormone mediated IGF-1 secretion. So you have to say, why would you want to give this to young girls who are growing? And obviously, you can't measure serum level to titrate or adjust the dose. And being an endocrinologist, I believe endocrinology is you give the drug, you measure the level, you adjust the dose. That's endocrinology. So what does a pill look like, combined pill? You have 21 days of fixed dose, ethanol, estradiol, and progesterone. You take a seven-day gap, during which time a hypogenal woman has got no hormone replacement, and you then start all over again. Uh, so what is the uh, HRT? So cyclical HRT is continuous estradiol and the progesterone is two weeks on, two weeks off. Or, or we can take continuous combined, which is the same dose of progesterone spread over the 28 days. Um, or actually you can have the progesterone as a myrena intrauterine device and thus take the, just estradiol orally or transdermally. So just think, if you're on the combined pill, um, you're actually having 25% less estrogen and you're having 50% um, more progesterone. If you're taking the combined pill back to back, 
you're having 100% more progesterone. I mean, the progesterone from WHI study is what gives the association with breast cancer. So there are some studies showing comparison of the combined pill versus fixed dose HRT. So this is HRT at fixed dose, not exploiting the possibility of titrating according to levels. Uh, and uh, we know that studies tend to show that um, a better blood pressure control uh, with HRT uh, and uh, improvement, uh, slightly better bone density. Um, and then two more studies, um, not randomized, but certainly um, HRT or, and the combined pill were better than nothing, but HRT was slightly better, was better uh, at improving bone density, even at fixed dose. More recent study using the pill back to back found that it was as good as uh, fixed dose HRT for bone density, but of course they gave no blood pressure data um, and they were given the pill back to back. So 100% more progesterone than is required for um, uterine, for individual health. So I'm gonna propose some, some sensible, guidance, sensible guidance to you. So this is actually guidance for, for trans women from the Northeast of England. And, and I put to you that compared to the big international guidance on regular women, this is astonishingly sensible. We don't use s because it's associated with increased cardiovascular mortality. We don't use s nor Premarin, conjugating equinestrians, because of the increased risk of venous thromboembolism. We adjust the estradiol dose according to serum level. We achieve levels that are in the upper half to the third of the normal female follicular range, which is around 300 to 600 picomol milliliter, depending on the laboratory. And the doses, we give whatever dose is required to achieve those levels. It's endocrinology. You give the hormone, you measure the level, you adjust the dose accordingly. Um, and some rationales for, for titrating the dose. We know there's a great, big variation in bioavailability, both with a single dose and at steady state. Have you give estradiol, oral, transdermal gel, or transdermal patch? Um, and uh, we also know that uh, looking at women in Turner syndrome, taking various fixed doses, that actually we see that it takes the higher doses uh, to achieve uh, adequate serum levels, which are similar to those you might see in healthy women with all menses. And remember that HRT, the fixed dose, these levels are formulated to shut down menopausal hot flushes um, in older women. And they may therefore be inadequate for younger women who require them for bone health and sexual health and cardiovascular health. So that was the biochemical rationale. Um, there's also reproductive rationale. And this relates to um, women with congenital hypogonadism and induction of puberty. We know that incremental estrogen and deferring progesterone will optimize breast development outcomes with fertile induction. But actually we pay inadequate attention to uterine development as a marker of satisfactory pubertal maturation. And uh, we know that higher doses of estradiol may be required in order to achieve optimum uterine maturation in hypogonadal girls. And remember, if uterus doesn't mature properly, then even if you are rendered fertile, say as a cowman with ovulation induction, you, your chance to take the pregnancy to term will be less if you start off with a uterus that not a, not a decent size. And we know that ethanol estradiol, so particularly the combined or, or contraceptive pill, may be associated with particularly poor uterine maturation. So dead from Newcastle, over 100 women with, with congenital hypogonadism, all on HRT, we have no women on the pill. Uh, nearly two thirds gonadal dysgenesis, Turner's or otherwise, about 20% with central hypogonadism, uh, Kalman syndrome, septoc dysplasia charge, combined trauma deficiency, and 7% with the XY hypogonadism, complete AIS, gonadal dysgenesis, 70 beta HSD. Of these, um, three quarters of women achieved target levels of estradiol on HRT. But actually, nearly half of these women required non standard H estradiol dose. They, they required standard HRT plus extra estradiol added in in order to achieve a target range estradiol level. Um, so, patch more than 100 milligrams twice weekly, gel more than one milligram a day, oral greater than two milligrams a day. So your standard HRT is inadequate in around 50% of hypogonadal young women. And so it's quite surprising 
that even the standard dose of HRT still performs as well as the back-to-back -back contraceptive pill. Therefore, one would hope that using a, in terms of bone density, therefore one would hope that using titrated HRT should enable it to clearly outperform even back-to-back -back combined pill. So my conclusions, hypogonal girls should receive pubertal induction with incremental dose of estradiol with progesterone deferred until you've achieved adequate breast and uterine maturation. Hypogonal movement should be treated with physiological HRT regimens based on estradiol and not with other molecules, whether synthetic or horse derived. Standard HRT products lack adequate estradiol for the metabolic bone and reproductive health of many hypogonadal women. Standard products should be supplemented with traditional estradiol when you achieve inadequate serum levels. Endocrinology is replace the missing hormone by titrating the, the dose against clinical response and serum hormone levels. We already do this for men, so I think we should do it for women as well. So many thanks. Um, here's a few guidelines that I um, assisted in the uh, uh, drawing up. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And I will go back to our screen. Professor Tasmin, am I, are you back online now? Okay, I'm right here. Um, there, let's do three quick questions that we have in the chat box. And uh, uh, Dr. Quinton, if you could answer them for us uh, quickly. So the first question is, is unexplained anemia in an elderly male uh, an indication for testosterone administration? Um, no, but I would say it's only in the context of a research study. In clinical practice, it's certainly an indication to screen them for hypogonadism. Um, and particularly unexplained anemia or osteoporosis in, in an elderly male, that's, it's worth screening them for hypogonadism because if they are hypogonadal and uh, you can treat them with testosterone, you will improve bone density and you will improve their anemia and improve their frailty. Um, it's not a treatment with men with primary frailty of, of old age, but if they are probably hypogonadal with a raised LH level and low testosterone, they will benefit from, from testosterone. Okay, another quick one. Uh, testosterone can be given in young males with low testosterone levels and oligospermia. Um, well, it depends what the context is. If, if they want fertility, definitely not. So uh, if, a, if a man wants fertility, testosterone is probably the last thing that you should give them. And the reason is that uh, in the male testes, testosterone levels are about 30 to 100 times higher than in the circulation. And these very high levels are needed um, in order to allow spermogenesis. If you give exogenous testosterone, you will then, by negative feedback, reduce LH and FSH levels. And even though you've increased your blood levels of testosterone, you will actually crash the levels in the testes, uh, thereby um, impairing spermogenesis. So don't even go near testosterone uh, in a man with fertility issues. Okay, the last question that we have at the moment is, at what level of PSA you recommend that testosterone replacement mm -hmm. should we start? And can we restart it again in a lower dose once PSA becomes normal? Uh, so um, the, there are, the, there are age-related PSA normal ranges. Um, there will be two reasons to stopping testosterone. Uh, one is if your PSA goes above the, the normal range. The second would be um, if it's shooting up very rapidly within the normal range. Under both these circumstances, uh, you should refer for a uro urology opinion. Uh, men who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer um, and have been treated with curative intent um, and, and have had their anti-antigen treatment for two years, they may be restarted on testosterone, provided that cancer wasn't too aggressive and the urologist is okay with that. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Quinton. That was uh, illuminating in more ways than one. I particularly would like to mention the measuring of estriol levels and titrating replacement therapy in accordance with that, because that is something that is not done universally, I think, because it appears in the guidelines. And we've had our, 
our uh, um, students say, fellows say this to us that you know the guideline says you shouldn't measure east dial level but this just defies you know any endocrinology that we do that why particularly choose estrogen for not measuring and titrating whereas you do it for every other thing every other hormone so i'm sure we'll have more discussion on this subject uh, let me now move on to uh, professor lubna pal um, so um, our next illustrious speaker professor lubna pal is one of us she um, is rooted very much in karachi but for many decades has now been in new york after going through uk and her mrcog training there first She is currently the professor and vice chair of education, Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Service Sciences, Yale School of Medicine, fellowship director, Yale Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility, director, Yale REI Program for Polycystic Ovary Syndrome, and director, Yale REI Menopause Program. So, um, as you can see from her credentials, that. Lubna is just the right person to address the complexities involved in the diagnosis of polycystic ovary syndrome but from the perspective of a of an obstetrician and gynecologist and uh, hopefully she will help us tease out some of the various uh, different things held under this umbrella of polycystic ovary syndrome so over to you professor lubna pal Thank you so much, this name. Thanks so much for this privilege. Uh, absolute pleasure to join. Just for everybody to know, graduate of Dow Medical College, 1988. Pleasure to be back with you. Um, it's it's going to be a challenge for me after our esteemed first speaker to to keep up with the standard that is set. But I've got about 20, 25 minutes to go through, and hopefully convey to the audience that polycystic ovary syndrome is heterogeneous. um and the label one label does not fit all so it is time to debunk this entity to reflect to go deep and to really be be uh, comfortable in managing a patient with the symptomatology without necessarily going trigger happy and giving a label of pcos to every patient that we come across so i'm hoping um it's not advancing for me Okay, my slides are. Oh, got it. No disclosures from my end as relates uh, to this particular talk. So, hoping that the audience will gain familiarity with our current understanding on heterogeneity uh, in the presentation, as well as the pathophysiology of polycystic ovary syndrome. For this audience of endocrinologists and internists, I really am not going to belabor. um the aspect of how relevant insulin resistance and adiposity is to the overall clinical picture but to all to underscore that insulin resistance and adiposity can masquerade pcos and at least based on my experience seeing women with pcos from the subcontinent presenting to us uh, in united states insulin resistance really dominates the clinical picture in terms of um as a mechanism for the patient presentation for pcos uh we'll touch upon the health implications that extend well beyond ovulation and fertility and again the goal here for me as a gynecologist and a reproductive endocrinologist is to sensitize all of us that management of pcos is a collaborative effort between gynecologists and between internists and family practice and primary care physicians because many of these women present to us um, uh, for menstrual issues or for fertility issues once the menstrual issues are addressed temporarily they're like a bandaid of oral contraceptives is placed on them uh, and they nothing else is examined and they go out in the population um, and continue to march towards lifetime risks uh, and when they get pregnant and deliver they're really lost to the system till they come they try to attempt a pregnancy again so one needs to create a collaborative approach to address the needs of this patient population and then i'm hoping i would be able to convince um, that it's really not rocket science it's not difficult to manage pcos if only we would look at the patient and address the needs of the patient 
rather than treat the label, let's treat the patient. And if we approach this entity that way, management can be pretty simple and effective. So um, the clinical uh, hallmarks of polycystic ovary syndrome are menstrual irregularity with oligomenorrhea or infrequent menses dominating the clinical picture, less than eight periods in 12 months or cycles that are more than 45 days apart. So that's one of the commonest clinical presentations. Symptoms of androgen excess, which could be hirsutism, excessive androgenic pattern of hair growth, um, and acne are the two common symptoms. Now, it is so important for us collectively to understand that the pattern of hair growth that is deemed to be excessive for women is really based on data coming out of Western societies. We need normative data for our population from South Asia, our Pakistani population, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, our population to really understand what is abnormal in our patient population. Just because I am bothered by my hair and use depilation does not mean I have a pathological spectrum of hair growth. I just may be cosmetically bothered by it. And I may look just like my mom and my sisters and my mom may have had seven children. So let's really collectively work towards uh, categorizing what is abnormal hair excess in our women. Um, and then hyperandrogenemia, which is elevated circulating levels of androgens. And the dominant androgen here is testosterone, total testosterone, as well as free testosterone being elevated, recognizing um, that our prior speaker has really sort of set up the stage for me in terms of the sex hormone binding globulin being a driver of free androgens. And obesity does drive down, and particularly insulin resistance, drives down sex hormone binding globulin. So I am a believer that total testosterone tells us so much more about uh, the classic form of polycystic ovary syndrome, whereas free androgens could be elevated just by weight gain and in worsening insulin resistance. So I do believe insulin resistance can make any woman look like PCOS at some stage of her life. Um, so hirsutism and acne really are the two common clinical stigmata a thinning of scalp hair, female pattern hair loss is presented in about 20% of the patient population that may be a presenting symptom to underscore it is not virilization, it is not male pattern hair loss that we are talking about. We're talking about a crown, thickening, thinning of um, scalp hair, widening of the central parting that is prevalent in this population. And lastly is the um, a morphological appearance of ovaries on ultrasound called the polycystic ovarian morphology, which focuses on ovarian volume. So a plump ovary, an ovary instead of being an almond uh, looking ovary, it looks like a golf ball. It has a sp spherical appearance. There is dense stroma and there are multiple antral follicles measuring less than nine millimeters. Till fairly recently, we had got put the threshold at 12. So more than or equal to 12 follicles, even, even one ovary um, led to a diagnosis of polycystic ovarian morphology. So we have three prevalent criteria, NIH criteria, Rotterdam, and more recently in United States, at least is the Androgen Excess Society, PCOS Society criterion, uh, which uh, uh, basically saying any two of these spectra could be present in a patient for us to label a patient as polycystic ovary syndrome. I just want to underscore here, just because a patient meets criteria does not mean she has polycystic ovary syndrome. We have got to exclude differential diagnoses. We have to look at the trajectory of her uh, uh, progression of her symptoms um, and take it from there. So somebody who has regular periods all her life gains 20 pounds of weight, starts having irregular periods, starts growing some hair in her chin, it's so common for me to see those patients be labeled as PCOS and sent to me for management of PCOS. So, so this is what we are working with. Um, for a gynecologist and a reproductive endocrinologist, ultrasound is like a stethoscope to a pulmonologist or an internist. So we use it all the time. And I would, I would urge my gynecological colleagues to really get comfortable with their own assessments um, rather than depend on a radiologist to provide you a read. Panel on the left is um, um, identifies a polycystic ovarian morphology, dense central stroma, peripherally pushed small follicles. More recently, 
consensus, uh, uh, um, different uh, panels of discussions, different authorities across the globe have challenged the number of 12 follicles only to meet criteria for PCOM. And now the upcoming recommendations are ovaries should have at least 25 or more follicles in any one ovary for, to uh, meet the polycystic ovary morphology criteria. That has not made it to clinical care yet, but people are really starting to realize that newer technology advanced radiological imaging you get to see so many follicles in young, young ovaries anyway. So let's not overcall polycystic ovarian morphology. Panel on the right reflects what is called a multifollicular ovary, commonly seen in young women with hypothalamic amenorrhea. Again, a radiologist may call this ovary on the right a polycystic ovary. It is not a polycystic ovary. The stroma you can see is attenuated. It's just an ovary. It's like a car park. The cars have just not moved out yet. Um, so pathophysiology, as we and we started the journey of our understanding of PCOS, assuming, believing, and it still holds that the primary problem lies at the level of the hypothalamus and the HPO, hypothalamus pituitary ovarian disruption, is the primary mechanism that drives downstream phenomena. So mm. the pulsatility of GnRH determines dominance of FSH versus LH production by the pituitary. And that really is what seems to be disrupted in uh, patients with classic polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, and with LH pulsatility being exaggerated, LH has direct effects at the level of the ovarian theca to contribute to excessive production of ovarian androgens. So PCOS is a state where hyperandrogenemia is primarily of ovarian origin. Although about one third of the patients DHEAS levels are mildly elevated, there is some adrenal contribution. <clears throat> Mechanisms are unclear. Shutting the HPO axis with a GnRH um, analog can dampen down the circulating levels of DHEAS, suggesting that maybe LH has some contribution to this adrenal production of androgens. In the last 20 years, we have really begun to understand that insulin resistance seems to be a driver of both disruption of HPO axis and production of androgens directly from the ovaries contributing to both one and two. And more recent realization is anti-mullerian hormone, uh, which is a peptide hormone that is produced by the ovarian granulosa cells that is higher in patients with multifollicular polycystic ovaries um, and that may be setting the stage of HPO dysfunction in utero and subsequently we are still at the literally nascent phases of understanding the mechanisms of anti-mullerian hormone. Panel on the right just identifies sources of androgens in women. I just want to underscore that exogenous uh, absorption of androgens we are seeing in young women with older partners who seem to be using transdermal testosterone. So we're seeing young women who are doing fine and now presenting with menstrual irregularity and circulating e uh, elevated levels of total testosterone. So at least in the US, that is something in our differential diagnosis. So this is a complex slide, but it really is there to convey to you the complexity of how insulin resistance can intervene and impact on every component of the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian uterine axis. Panel on the left identifies, so there is some, some resistance that is really probably genetically determined. So GWAS studies have identified target genes that are involved in insulin signaling and downstream pathways. So we do believe that at some level, there is innate insulin resistance in a patient. Now we are beginning to really appreciate that in utero exposures may determine that insulin resistance. So a uh, baby born to a obese mother with gestational diabetes, type two diabetes may already be programmed to have insulin resistance even before appearing in this world. Once insulin, insulin resistance <clears throat> is established, downstream effects are direct effects at the level of the ovarian theca to produce androgens. The androgens dampen the effects, uh, the production of sex hormone dividing globulin as does insulin. Result is net increase in androgens net increase in androgens further worsen the insulin resistance. So it becomes a vicious cascade. And the panel on the right really identifies insulin having effects at so many levels. So 
insulin resistance really is appearing as the driver of the pathophysiology of this entity called polycystic ovary syndrome. Now in the clinical field, you clinically, a patient with central adiposity and obesity is insulin resistant. But acanthosis nigricans, recognizing that the distinction and the detection of acanthosis is so dependent on the background skin color of the population. But um, this is an important clinical hallmark of insulin resistance. In the lab experimental um, arena, CLAMP studies are the gold standard of identifying insulin resistance. Fasting insulin levels are commonly used to reflect insulin resistance. Um, but unlike the adult, older uh, adult population, women with reproductive age women with PCOS, commonly, at least in my experience, tend to have normal fasting levels of insulin. It's a panel on the right, which mm. reflects, so the vertical axis is de uh, demonstrating plasma levels of insulin, horizontal axis is de uh, demonstrating time points um, following a glucose tolerance test. These effects are comparable when you, whether you give IV bolus of insulin or oral, but much more exaggerated insulin response happens when you give oral um, bolus of um, glucose to this population. So blue line represents what happens to the insulin levels in a normal population. Orange represents what happens in a type two diabetic, recognizing the type two diabetics have a higher fasting level of insulin. PCOS women tend to have ballpark normal levels fasting of insulin, but when you give them a bolus of glucose, their insulin levels become tremendously exaggerated and they stay exaggerated for a long time. In our population population, we've done studies, reactive hypoglycemia is commonly encountered in this patient population. So insulin resistance really can be determined clinically, can be determined utilizing tests, which we commonly use in our clinical practice. So the journey of our understanding of PCOS really started in adult, when I was a med student and a resident, um, we really were catching our un, uh, identifying patients at the level of adulthood. But over the past nearly 30 years, we have really gone backwards and have come to understand the underpinnings of PCOS phenotype are established in utero. So, and adiposity, obesity, dysglycemia, insulin resistance are all playing a role. Chances are epigenetic changes are happening. Clearly epigenetic changes in the placentas of these pregnancies are well described and have been related to adiposity in pediatric age group. Pe heavier young girls are much more likely to land up having a PCOS-like phenotype. Um, and that is some, so in the P, so I cannot underscore the importance of having pediatricians, OBGYNs, internists all work together in minimizing the burden of PCOS and its related sequela at the population level. So these are the common um, uh, patients from my clinic when I first started um, looking at PCOS, uh, old data, but really represents what we have. Oligomenorrhea is probably the commonest presentation, but polymenorrhea, mm. heavy erratic periods are, is, are also common. Excessive hair growth, acne, and then thinning of scalp hair. Um, so recognizing oligomenorrhea, so many other factors contribute to menstrual irregularity and HPO dysfunction. For this audience, I want to underscore eating disorders, psychological distress, physical distress, abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, huge underpinnings to irregularity of menses. So just because a girl has irregular menses does not mean she has PCOS. We've got to rule out these things. Excessive hair growth, I underscored the importance for our population. We need to define what is normal before we start calling everybody who is needing depilation or wanting depilation as abnormal. Mm -hmm. Recognizing genetic profiles and idiopathic uh, excess, uh, hirsutism are common entities. Um, in terms of acne, we need to be sensitive to the fact that pubertal acne is physiological. Just because a 14 year old has acne and has irregular periods, please don't give her a label of PCOS. Infectious etiology of acne, particularly in young people who nibble their nails. 
they bite their nails and they rub their face. They bite. It's a vicious cycle. It's well documented and observed in our pediatric patient population. And once you abort, try to abort that phenomena, acne starts to improve. And thinning of scalp hair again, her maternal, paternal history of scalp hair loss as they age is important. And then metabolic underpinnings, our own data, we published this, that disc glycemia in women with PCOS, those who are disc glycemic are much more likely to acknowledge hair loss and hair thinning. And then micronutrients, iron deficiency and um, biotin deficiency are common in this population. So a few cases from my practice, 15 year old, presenting with painful periods, prolonged cycles, menarche since 12, she has acne on her chin, progressive weight gain, she's depressed, she's anxious. She was sent to get an ultrasound scan, abdominal ultrasound scan, and was told she has PCOS and was sent to me for consultation with PCOS accompanied by her mom. Both patient and mom are even more bothered by the fact that she will have fertility problems later on in life because she has polycystic ovary syndrome. The girl is petrified that she has big cysts in her ovary. Does she have PCOS? So some pertinent details. Her mom had gestational diabetes. She was a macrosomic baby. All her pediatric um, trajectory, she was a greater than the 90th percentile for parameters. She has behavioral psychological issues. And to underscore, abdominal ultrasound scan findings should not be used for diagnosing PCOS in adolescents. This is only for adult population, not for young people. This is another patient, Pakistani girl, came to me to see me in US, diagnosed with PCOS at age 25. Her need is primary infertility. She visited back home, had an ultrasound scan done, was told she had polycystic ovaries. She does wax her hair. Her periods are a little bit irregular. And she was told she had PCOS. Pertinent details, her periods were regular till past 12 months. She got married, she moved to US, she misses her family, she's alone, she's gained a few pounds, changes in diet, limited exercise, her hair growth pattern is just like her mom. She does not have PCOS. This is a patient, again, sent to me on pills, um, diagnosed PCOS at age 17, meets all the criteria except she has late onset congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Another patient, sent to me for thinning of scalp hair, has irregular periods, polycystic appearing ovaries, except she has suppressed gonadotropin levels. She's an athlete. She has hypothalamic dysfunction. Her, she has low sex hormone binding globulin. Her estradiol levels are barely detectable. And she has slight elevation in free testosterone. She does not have PCOS. So health implications in the interest of time, I'm moving forth to say for this audience, I just want to underscore Endometrial pathology, women with classic uh, PCOS who are hyperandrogenic, who are overweight to obese, who are insulin resistant, are at risk for endometrial hyperplasia and even endometrial cancer, regardless of their age. Their erratic bleeding pattern requires endometrial sampling to rule out underlying disorder. And mental health should be focused on in this patient population. Plenty of data now showing prevalence of Morbidities, depression, severe depression, anxiety are way higher in this population. Chicken or the egg is difficult to tease out. Is it the cause or is it the effect? But I already, I hope conveyed to you the moment mental health is affected, hypothalamus pituitary axis gets affected. So dep in depressed people, don't be trigger happy in labeling them with PCOS. It could be their depression and their psychological stress that is contributing to her bother. So. To my mind, I mean, I see all the time patients have referred to me for the management of PCOS and I and my residents, when they present, patient is here for management of PCOS. It's such a frustrating moment. It's like, a, what does that mean? What is her bother? What are her needs and what are her risks? Now, my bother may be acne, but my need may be fertility, right? So we have to approach each patient looking at why is she here with me? What are priorities in her life? And what are her risks based on her personal history and her family history? Um, so evaluation, just to comment upon again, for this audience, 
features of hyperandrogenism, we really need to objectify what is hirsutism for Pakistani women. And when we do a pelvic ultrasound in, the, in this population, we're not looking for polycystic ovaries. It's really a clinical assessment. You should focus on endometrial echo because you're worried about, is it a distorted thickened endometrium that requires sampling? So just to underscore, Evaluations, just to mention that when you measure androgens in women who have prolonged cycles, time them to early follicular phase. There's no urgency. You can wait a few weeks till her next period happens, or you can give her a progesterone induced bleeding, but time it around early follicular phase because if they happen to be mid cycle, I may have long cycles, but I may still ovulate. Her androgens would be bumped up anyway. If you are measuring gonadotropins, again, time them in the early follicular phase. Insulin, I hope I've been able to convey to you that if I'm interested in measuring insulin, I prefer a provoked insulin challenge rather than fasting insulin. Um, so really management then becomes what's your bother? So if your bother is abnormal menses and you are overweight to obese, <coughs> the first line approach really is lifestyle. Combined hormonal formulations have a huge role to play in regulating the menses, provided the patient understand the mechanism of action. Now, I would make a pitch to our population that please switch from using combined oral contraceptives, which have social connotations in the population, to a combined hormonal formulation, which may be an acceptable terminology. Uh, progesterone only agents are effective, Insulin sensitizers do, and metformin is the prototype, does improve the cyclicity of uh, menses in this population, provided given long enough. It takes a minimum of three months for metformin to do anything to the HPO axis. And for uterine endometrial um, protection against this unopposed estrogen, which this population is at risk, sort of gets exposed to because their ovaries are still making some estradiol and their body fat stores are converting androgens to estrogens. Levonorgestrel intrauterine devices offer excellent uh, endometrial protection. Um, I guess in the, in the context of social norms, so sexually active women not seeking fertility, this may be a <coughs> great opportunity uh, uh, device to use. If the bother is excess symptoms of androgen excess, combined hormone formulations and or anti-androgenic agents such as spironolactone um, or um, uh, five alpha reductase inhibitors such as finasteride. Data do show that when you combine the two, you get more efficacy than when you use only one, recognizing that anti-androgens are teratogenic. So if a sexually active woman is prescribed an anti-androgen, please do combine it with a reliable contraceptive approach. Uh, the only place where deuteresteride may have a role in managing hyperandrogenism is in managing um, uh, thinning of scalp hair. And considerations when you're choosing your combined hormonal formulation really is, does she need contraception? Is it, you need to have that perspective because some patients may have some bother from these agents. What dose of ethanyl estradiol should be in the pill? Is it appropriate for her family to be told I'm giving her a contraceptive? and really focus on what is the progestin component of that pill, because choosing a neutral progestin or an anti-androgen progestin, such as spironolactone, which is uh, uh, um, drosperinone, which is available to us in US, or ciproteron acetate, which is available to you in Pakistan, uh, would be an appropriate regimen. And I would argue that if a patient had ir uh, painful periods, irregular, albeit painful, choose a continuous OCP regimen. There's no need to give her cyclic menses when the menses are painful for her. I have a cheat sheet in my office in terms of dosages and the types of progestins, and I would urge you to really have that available to you so you can match the pill to the patient's needs using lowest ethanol estradiol dose for patients who have psychological issues who get pre-MS very easily. And in women who have um, excessive bleeding issues, maybe a more potent progestin would be an appropriate choice. In the interest of time, I'm going to move on. So metformin, I'm not going to belabor to this audience other than saying it does have a role in managing both menstrual issues as well as infertility seeking women with PCOS because it does reduce the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome um, related to use of gonadotropins. 
Um, fertility seekers, the only aspect to this audience is an anovulatory woman can have a partner who's azospermic. She can have blocked tubes. So please, she needs an evaluation and risk mitigation, preconception risk mitigation. And for the internist and the endocrinologist in this audience, once she delivers, she needs long-term surveillance because her risk for type 2 diabetes is really high. So time for a paradigm shift. Panel on the left is how we have been managing PCOS. Oh, you have two of the you have polycystic ovaries on ultrasound, you have irregular periods, you have acne, whoops, you have PCOS. I think we need to really first talk about what are the mechanisms at play for each one of these entities. They are all intertwined, they are all interrelated and I need to unmask them. And once I have unmasked them, I choose the appropriate treatment strategy for managing this population. Um, and differential diagnoses, please keep them in consider, sort of, we have got to consider them, rule them out. So as a reproductive endocrinologist, I believe the terminology PCOS is misleading. I believe the terminology is restrictive because it really reduces the management of a complex entity to be handled by only a subset of providers who may be excellent providers, but they will not follow the patient through her life's journey. And the diagnosis of PCOS in young women can be tremendously burdensome on them. You don't have to give a diagnosis in order to give, do justice to her conditions. So take home, it's heterogeneous. Not everyone who meets criteria has PCOS. Worsening insulin resistance can mimic PCOS. Treat the patient, not the diagnosis and individualized management approach. I've been, I hope I've been able to debunk or at least attempted to do so. Sorry, this name, I went a little bit over. Happy to address any questions. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Lubna, for that detailed uh, uh, discussion of the issues involved here. Um, I'm now going to, before we uh, take um, questions from uh, the audience, who are very interested in both the talks. I'm going to engage the panelists here. And I'm going to ask, first of all, uh, Professor A.H. Amir to see if he has a comment or a question for any of the two speakers or, or a comment about the subject of the talks. Professor Amir? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sim, for uh, uh, conducting this session. Thank you, P.S., for engaging uh, lovely, wonderful speakers. Uh, and uh, uh, this session, uh, very uh, pertinent. Um, I think uh, in terms of thought given by um, oh, Richard Quinton, um, it was important. I, I, I think that uh, what he mentioned were the manifestations of uh, hypogonadism really depending on the patient's age and development when the hypogonadism occurs. And very pertinent points that he raised, the, that the goals are generally to correct testosterone uh, to mid to normal level. Now, you know, this is just a, a comment and a question as well, that so far we've been living in this part of the world with just one preparation of um, a male androgen replacement. Um, uh, and he mentioned about uh, libido, which we don't have um, here, the long acting one. Um, and the, the experience with the gel that which is recently available is limited. And I just wonder, and this question from Richard Quinton, that in, in a thick skin, uh, dark, thick, dark skin, hairy, um, Asian population, would it matter that uh, the amount of uh, testosterone gel which is used? So that will be very interesting for us. That what are the peak levels, and uh, you know what to expect uh, from from using these gels, which is recently been available. As I said, in our population, our temperatures, uh, we have limited experience, and I would uh, you know like to ask. Uh, this from which you can, in terms of uh, Dr. Lubna's talk, a wonderful talk, a good recap of what she mentioned about uh, PCOS, um, and and very rightly so that PCOS is a diagnosis of exclusion, and that has to be 
done and other uh, causes need to be ruled out. And I just wonder what is her experience in terms of using the GLP-1 analogs um, for, for a weight reduction. I, of course, it goes without saying that lifestyle changes are very, very pertinent and very important, and you can't go without it. What about this GLP analog in her experience in PCOS ladies? So that's for me. Thank you very much. So in that order, Professor, uh, Dr. Quinton, could you answer the question raised by Dr. Amir? Uh, yes, yes, I, I, I can. Um, I have to say that um, uh, colleagues who work in, in, in hot climates tell me that um, the gels and the, patch, and the patches for men and women uh, tend not to work so well in terms of like uh, taking a long time to dry, staying tacky all day, coming off on their clothes or, 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 or peeling off. Of course, there are some people who live in hot climates who actually aren't exposed to heat. So uh, in a sense, if, if your journey is from air conditioned car to air conditioned house to air conditioned hotel, then you won't really notice that, uh, that, that, that external temperature. Um, but I think, um, uh, sorry, yeah. yeah, but, uh, but I have to say, uh, I, I would go for a, an injectable testosterone, uh, if I were a patient, um, in, 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 in a, in a warmer country, um, or a doctor working with patients in a warmer country, definitely. Thank you, Dr. Quinton and, uh, Professor Lubna Pal, could you? Address. Sure. Thanks. So. Thank you so much for that question. So I have experience with GLP analogs in the management of metabolic syndrome in patients with PCOS. There are published data, at least a couple of randomized controlled trials that have shown benefit of GN uh, GLP analogs um, in uh, weight loss, in improved metabolic profiles, as well as in improving menstrual cyclicity in that population. It's a very expensive agent in our part of the world. It's an agent which for patients seeking fertility, it is not something to be recommended because there are really no data of safety. So one has to, so for fertility seeking patient, it does not have a role. For metabolic management patient, it absolutely does have a role. At our end, insurances do not approve it unless you have failed um, uh, at least a minimum of three months trial of an oral uh, insulin sensitizer, or if you're not tolerating it. And in the medical legal environment, um, um, episodes of pancreatitis, very rare, but they're nonetheless. So th they require much closer monitoring. So I, I do believe lifestyle has a huge role to play. I don't believe we need to go big guns unless we need to do so for health aspects. But otherwise, these young women with diet and exercise in a policed regimen should lose weight, and they should gain benefit from their um, uh, benefit for their reproductive physiology. Thank you. So while we're at it, uh, Professor Lubda, can you just uh, address a quick question from um, one of our colleagues? And the question is that, uh, uh, what is the ideal treatment for metroragia in PCOS if there is contraindication to combined pills in a single girl? Thanks. So progesterone is a phenomenal tool available to us. You don't need to be giving combination hormone formulations. You can give high dose progesterone in this population to control bleeding you can keep her on continuous progestin regimen. She will remain amenorrheic. You can do it for three months and stop it. You will achieve decidualization of her endometrium, pinning of her endometrium. Now recognize this menometrorrhagia patient should have endometrial sampling, particularly if you do an ultrasound and you see thick distorted endometrium. The youngest hyperplasia patient I have seen was 16 years old. So I cannot underscore the importance of endometrial surveillance in this population, but high dose progesterone. So Provera, medroxyprogesterone acetate, 20 milligrams a day. You can give it anything from 14 days to up to three months to achieve a pause on this erratic bleeding pattern. And then you can have her take cyclic progesterone every three months 
chances are the, this degree of bad episode of dysfunctional uterine bleeding happens when uh, prolonged cycles, you know, infrequent cycles, women who have one, two, three menses in a year, sort of prolonged periods of oligomenorrhea are the ones who land up having such massive bleedings and erratic bleeding. So progesterone, use that tool. Thank you, Professor Lubna. May I now invite uh, our uh, second panelist, uh, uh, Professor uh, Hoshid Khan, for his comments or any questions that he has for the two eminent speakers. Professor uh, Hoshid Khan. Thank you, Dr. Dasneem. Uh, it was a real treat to listen to both presentation from our prestigious speakers, Dr. Quinton and Dr. Lubna Paul. Really enjoyed it. Now, the PCOS is such a heterogeneous group of diverse disorders that I always say every, every patient has a different PCOS disease. Every patient is different from uh, other patient in terms of when it comes to PCOS, maybe based on her needs, maybe based on her bother, uh, like uh, Dr. Lubna very uh, uh, clearly elaborated on that. Now, my question, there are a couple of uh, questions I have here regarding PCOS. First of all, we have seen a, a huge surge in our younger population of PCOS compared, if, if you compare it with the previous generation. And uh, I'm not referring to our, uh, the, those younger patients who are overweight, weight, but rather referring to the patients who are lean and they have PCOS. And that's, you know, that's a very good, well known and published entity in South Asian population, lean PCOS patients. I remember when I was US, we always used to say, if you are not, if you are obese, not obese, then possibly the cause may be something else. It's not PCOS, look for something else in that patient. Lean PCOS is very rare in Caucasian population or, or in African American population. Now, why do you think that we have seen such a surge of PCOS patients uh, in our lean population. I'm not referring to our uh, morbidly, our obese or overweight patients. That's number one question. Is it based on some dietary habits we have, certain food consumptions? Uh, would like to hear your take on that. That's, first part, part of, that's one part of the question. Now, the second part of the question is about the frustration which I have while seeing a female, a young adolescent female, 17 year old, where mother is extremely, parents are worried about irregular menses, future fertility prospects, and her menses are very irregular, maybe once in every three months, four months time. And uh, for those, and this is the patient I'm referring, I'm, I'm talking about where all the other causes for uh, uh, underlying disease has been ruled out and it's uh, PCOS by exclusion. Uh, we do put them on oral contraceptive or combined hormonal formulation, like you said, but the roadblock comes when you take them off, stop them after three to six months time and patient is pretty much back in the same situation, uh, comes back, maybe another cycle of that. And then uh, we end up pretty much in the same territory, goes to a different doctor, goes through the same cycle. So it's very frustrating for me as a physician. I would like to get your take on this, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Khurshid. These are two loaded questions, great questions, but loaded questions. So I'm gonna to try to answer the second one first. So I cannot minimize how important psychological well-being is to menstrual regularity, to menstrual regulation. So young girl who has irregular periods, so we don't have to call her, you have PCOS. The data are 50%, 50% of pediatric adolescent PCOS-like patients as they outgrow, as they grow older, they outgrow this phenomena, right? So we don't have to label them with a burdensome label. You've gone through your workup and you have identified there are no correctable, fixable situations. Pay attention to her mental health. We see this all the time. Girls who go from high school to college, their periods become irregular. They start gaining weight, right? So part of this is why is it happening? Mental health aspect, I don't believe we 
do justice to that aspect. Secondly, when I choose, you don't have to give her combined hormonal formulation unless she also has features of androgen excess because combined formulation does a great job correcting both. But say if she has only irregular period, just give her progesterone once a month or once every three months, letting her know that you don't have a disorder. This is a functional phenomenon. It's like an orchestra. The conductor is probably not signaling right. So your symphony is erratic. And this, if I give you a birth control pill, even how, if I put, use it for three months, six months, when I stop it, you will be back to square one. So one approach is to really say, why am I using it? I'm using it to give you endometrial protection, then use progesterone. I'm a little bit wary of prescribing ethanol estradiol based formulations to young girls when the peak bone gain has not been established. There are a couple of longitudinal studies that seem to suggest that peak bone gain may be attenuated in OCP users. So I think it's, it's our naivety to think three months of OCPs will correct her. They will not. She, if we were gonna give her pills for her to feel comfortable that I am menstruating just like my peers, keep her on it till her phase of life changes. If she's gone to college, once she's out of college, but a few months of tamponade doesn't help. So we need a game line approach. We need a strategy and patient needs to understand why we are doing this. We are not correcting her HPO dysfunction by giving her a pill. We are just masking it. But if she feels better by that mask, I say, go for it. Because it's, if she has hyperandrogenism, it will help her. But don't stop it after three months or six months because she's going to go back to square one. It's not gonna correct itself, right? That's my answer to your second question. To your first question, I really have not seen any data on a global increase in incidence of PCOS. Prevalence, yes, not the incidence of PCOS. My deep belief is we mislabel. The patients that I identified in my, from my clinic population, we call people PCOS much more often. In our part of the world, gestational diabetes is prevalent. Maternal adiposity is prevalent. Small size babies, large size babies is probably perhaps small more than the large size babies is prevalent. We are a sedentary population. We don't, ex exercise is, is not a part and parcel of our existence. So, and then stress, young people are tremendously stressed regardless of where they are, cannot underscore so the moment a young girl has a regular period, mom takes her to a gynecologist, gynecologist does an abdominal scan, tells her, oh, you have PCOS, let's give you the pill. Girl does not know what it means. Mom has no idea what it means. You give her the oral contraceptive for six months. She assumes when I stop, I will become fine. <laughs> Doesn't work like that. We've got to we rule out things, but so I do believe I, the patients from Pakistan and India and Bangladesh that I see in US, inevitably they are insulin resistance on OGTT, their insulin levels provoked testing, even at 120 minutes, they're over hundred. They're just pouring out insulin. Um, they tend, they're not hyperandrogenic in terms of total androgens, their free testosterone is elevated because their sex hormone binding globulin is so low. They come, they eat processed foods there. So it's like a galaxy of possibilities here. So I really think we need to rethink when we call somebody PCOS. And I really believe we don't need to call somebody PCOS to treat her as long as we focus on what are we treating because PCOS is so muddy. Can I put two quick questions to uh, Dr. Quinton? Uh, this is from the chat box. Uh, what is the maximum recommended dose of estrogen if there is no proper uterine development in hypogonadal female? That's the one question. And the other is more like a comment uh, plus a question. Oral estradiol as compared to transdermal has shown higher risks of stroke and breast cancer. Giving very high doses may be catastrophic if transdermal not available like in Pakistan. Uh, so I'll answer the um, the second. I'll answer the second question first. Um, there's been a, a, some 
a belief that actually for estrogen, that transdermal is better or safer, in, particularly in terms of cardiovascular status and thrombosis. But actually, that probably doesn't relate to the type of est to the delivery system, it relates to the type of estrogen. So you can't give transdermal premarin horse estrogen. Um, and uh, outside the US, you can't give transdermal ethanol estradiol. Um, so I so I think that most of this oral versus transdermal thing comes up really against premarin and ethyl estradiol versus estradiol native. Um, and it's certain that, eth that estradiol has uh, lower thrombosis risk. Whether you can make that risk even lower by giving it transdermally, uh, I'm not sure. But the key thing is don't use premarin, don't use ethanol estradiol if you want to minimize the, um, the, thr the, thr the thrombosis risk. Um, maybe, maybe transdermal has some benefits, but the important thing is use the right compound. <laughs> the other question was in terms of maximum doses for, for uterine development. So uh, clearly if you're inducing puberty, you're going to start off with a low dose of estrogen because we know that starting low with estrogen and building up the dose gradually and deferring progesterone for as long as you can, that's what gives you optimum breast development. And actually that's what gives you optimum uterine development. Um, and historically what used to be done was, well, the moment a woman had some cramps um, and some bleeding or girl, uh, we'd say, okay, so you've got endometrial hyperplasia, now is the time to, to start the progesterone. Um, and I, my practice now is to say, okay, you got some cramping pain, a little bit of spotting. Are you happy with your breast development? Um, if, you, if you're not happy with the breast development, or if we're not happy, actually, we need to give you more time on estrogen alone. So I might even then back off the estrogen dose a little bit to allow the cramps to, um, to recede. Similarly, um, I would also say, well, let's see what the uterine maturations look like. If it looks like she's got a fully mature adult uterus and ultrasound in 3D, I say, you know what, this is okay. You're good to go now for cyclical estrogen progesterone HRT uh, because you've got well-formed breasts and well-formed uterus. However, if your uterus is still not fully developed, I would say, you know what, we're gonna back off on the estrogen dose a little bit, let those cramps go away and keep you an estrogen only for a bit longer, for as long as possible until your uterus mature before we give you the progesterone. So that's if you're inducing puberty. And then of course, when you, you, you pass through puberty and you're on your, your HRT until normal age of menopause, what is the estradiol dose you need as a young woman? Well, the answer is it's usually variable. Um, so, um, Almost nobody requires less than two milligrams oral estradiol a day. Um, and some women require more than that. Um, most I've used is, is, is five milligrams. It's whatever you need to achieve a, a, a physiological serum level. We wouldn't say, well, the most thyroxy you can have is 100 micrograms. Oh, your, estradiol, your, your TSH level may be 100, you know, 10 or 12, but we can't give you more than 100 micrograms of thyroxine. And really we need to apply the same criteria to um, HRT as we do to all other aspects of endocrinology and to accept that people's uh, bioavailability, their absorption is very different. And we just need to give a dose that's titrated uh, according to, um, to serum levels. Thank you, Dr. Quinton. That's like a breath of fresh air. Uh, I was going to invite Dr. Tabinda Dugal to get in at this point with her comments and her questions, if she has any. Thank you very much, both uh, Dr. Quinton and Dr. Pal, for your brilliant um, and, and, and really remarkable presentation. So I was going to pick on the point from Dr. Quinton, actually, about um, the estrogen for the um, um, puberty induction. Do you ever look at bone age, uh, you know, when the, you know, it's, um, it doesn't look like the child has quite caught on or the young person hasn't quite caught on to their height and the uterus looks quite good, but do you kind of tend to delay, you know, uh, introduction of progesterone if they still have got some height to catch looking at the bone age, or do you just rely on the uterine development alone? Um, I, do, I don't look at bone age. I, I, I think, I, I can't think of many circumstances in which bone age would change my management. So 
we we look at breast development um, and we also look at uh, uterine development. Um, and when we're happy with both, um, that's when we will um, uh, introduce the, the cyclical HRT um, with, with, with progesterone to induce, to induce regular, regular, regular bleeds. With the, um, historically, uh, pa pediatricians were very fixated on, on height, particularly in Turner syndrome. And um, there, was, there was a fashion decades ago of actually trying to delay estrogen as long as possible, uh, delay puberty whilst they poured in lots of growth hormone. Um, and the price for this was really rather bad uterine development. So we know for Turner syndrome, uh, if you delay estrogen uh, until you're after the age of 17, you're never actually going to get adequate uterine development, even if you manage it as well as you possibly can um, in terms of doses after age 17. So girls who've got, you know they've got a problem because they were diagnosed in childhood or even in utero, really you should be looking at starting very low dose estrogen um, before they're 10 years of age probably uh, with little micro doses. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, my next question also was to Dr. Quinton, and then I have a couple of questions for Dr. Pal. is uh, about, you know, you talked about the hormone replacement in uh, women, and do you ever prescribe, like, you know, the doses of, the, the dose that is um, for women, uh, testosterone to women who have got low libido as part of their HRT? Uh, no, I don't. And I know that that's quite a fashion amongst the uh, a gynecologist doing um, postmenopausal HRT, um, and there are some interesting data. The thing is, they don't know what they're doing, and I, I'm in the sense I, I'm not mean that in an insulting way. I'm just saying they're giving testosterone, but is the benefit of testosterone that of testosterone, or is the benefit of testosterone is this woman's not getting enough estrogen? We're giving her testosterone, and that's been converted to more estrogen. So is it, is, it, is it testosterone for its androgenic effect or is it testosterone given as pro-estrogen? And the only way to, do, to know the difference is to do the proper studies. And the proper studies involve replacing a woman to physiological doses of estradiol and then saying, okay, your libido is rubbish. Then we will, um, we will randomize you to testosterone or no testosterone. The other thing I would say about female libido is this. Um, is that um, we, we think a lot of it's kind of up here um, in, in the brain. Uh, but actually, um, what, my, what my patients tell me is there's nothing like having painful intercourse to really trash your libido. And, and if your, your estrogen levels are rubbish uh, and you've got um, a poorly estrogenized um, um, uh, vagina uh, with inadequate lubrication and sex is painful, your libido is going to be rubbish for very good reasons. My libido would be rubbish if it hurt me to have sex, I promise you. Um, and so I think there's also some misunderstanding as well as what, what are the mechanisms of, of, of low libido in postmenopausal women. Um, imagine a lot of it's upstairs, whereas quite a bit of it possibly may well be downstairs. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so um, a couple of questions for Dr. Pal. One was, you know how we've, I kind of try and use scoring system for the hair citizen, you know, Galway Ferryman type of thing. And, you know, there are some patients who are like Portuguese or Spanish origin, and you really, it, it, it isn't, it doesn't quite hold for them because uh, even their mothers will say, oh, because, you know, her grandmother is, is, is for such and such a, you know, descent. Um, you know, what is the way to develop one for our countries? Because, you know, we are normally very hair suit. And I think that there is, a very high incidence of the slim PCOS going around in the community, probably because of the eating habits and the lifestyle and all that. So I think it would be an extremely difficult task to take up to find someone who is, you know, going to be classed as part of population that can be used as a normal or what would you define as hirsutism in, 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 in that population. So if you had any suggestions, that would be great. My second uh, question was, do you ever use inhibin? Um, in, in your diagnosis um, of PCOS, it, uh, it, I think it comes and goes as a fashion, but I think some people are, are using it as a tool for other conditions in gynecology, but you know, do you ever use it for PCOS or insulin Thank, resistance? Thanks so much for the two questions. Um, I'll start with inhibin first. We the answer be, is no. We have, we have to be quick with the answers. Yeah. Inhibin answer is no. 
uh, anti-mullerian hormone is a much more sensitive marker that too has not make, made it to the diagnostic realm yet. Inhibin, the only role in women's health is if you're thinking about granulosa cell tumor where you <laughs> test for inhibin. Second question is prevalence in norm. We need normative data. We should be having young school girls, menstru you know, school health, menstrual history of the young girls and scoring system. You can have them score themselves. So there's a self-scoring option available for Perman Galway. That's a pretty reliable option. So we need to be literally scoring our normal population, not girls with problems, but all population, and then trying to put things together. Another approach could be your antenatal first visit, spontaneous pregnancies. These women didn't have problem. Let's have them score their um, uh, hair growth. But we've got to begin somewhere large so we understand what's normal for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's uh, something that Dr. Tasneem will probably take up at some stage. <laughs> yeah, remains my dream. Um, so um, uh, I, that gives me, uh, before we go on to the last uh, panelist, uh, maybe I'll throw in a, a couple of questions that I have here uh, from uh, people. There's one question for Dr. Quinton. Uh, from a 12-year-old girl with a factor 10 deficiency on regular fresh frozen plasma transfusion, can hormones help her? Um, I don't know. Why, why should, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't think of an intelligent answer to that. I'm not sure why they should um, help her unless, uh, unless she's got absent puberty or delayed puberty. If she's got absent puberty, then yes, yeah. of course, hormones will, will help her. And there are a couple of questions about the pelvic ultrasound transducer. So when you're saying pelvic ultrasound, we are talking about the trans abdominal lumina, not uh, an intravaginal. So we are talking about, so in pediatric age, abdominal approach to looking at the pelvis is undertaken. In non-sexually active women, particularly in our part of the world, the pelvic organs are looked at through a transabdominal approach. Whereas sexually active women, you approach it transvaginally. Regardless of this, the comment that I tried to convey really concept was, do not use ovarian morphology to call PCOS in pediatric adolescent population. Those criteria are for adults. Okay, and there's another question I have here about ovarian hyperthecosis in young premenopausal women and how does management differ from PCOS? So hyperthecosis is so rare. It really manifests in hyper, the, the entity hyperthecosis is really unmasked postmenopausally. It's cumulatively probably less than 1% of the hyperandrogenic population. Hyperthecosis, um, I can think of like two patients I have right now, both postmenopausal in their 50s, both obese, both significantly insulin resistance, uh, resistant. When we have, M when we look at MRI data, pelvic MRI data, MRI call of ovarian morphology as thecosis, you see a little bit higher than 1% prevalence in reproductive age women. So it's a, it's a question of, what modality was used to diagnose this condition, but in premenopausal women, hyperthecosis as an entity is extremely uncommon. It tends to present postmenopausally. Hyperandrogenic women will be called PCOS unless their ovaries come out for one reason or the other, or you do a wedge resection, which we should not be doing, and the tissue diagnosis is thecosis. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Lubnapal. Uh, now I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Busarat Riaz for uh, her observations and questions, if she has any. Uh, thank you very much. Very pertinent talks by both the speakers. Uh, just a comment to Dr. Lubna, uh, as you have already mentioned very rightly, and uh, we all have been listening to it, that PCOS is a misnomer from early on. So is there any chance that we can correct this terminology? Because many a time we see patients coming to us only with ultrasounds. And in Pakistan, where we are practicing, there is uh, no definite criteria of doing ultrasound. People coming with just few cysts and being diagnosed as PCOs. So is there any chance that we can have a different terminology in the near future? What's your take on it? Thank you so much for that question. 
I think a easier approach, should the terminology be changed, there's a debate going on for the past 15 years at least with no consensus happening. So I don't see a change happening in my career timeline part. But what I could tell you, and I can underscore, people should not be getting an ultrasound to make a diagnosis of PCOS. You know, it does not add, unless I'm worried about the endometrium and I'm getting an ultrasound to really look at that. But, and so it's very unfortunate that we don't have time to talk to our patients. We just want to give them a diagnosis and then give them a prescription and that's it. So my suggestion is an easier adopted approach is to say, please don't use ultrasound unless your management will change based on findings. Um, but for now we're working with, unfortunately, uh, this is what we have. And it, it requires consensus at so many levels that it was easier to remove Trump than PCOS being changed. <laughs> Thank you. Just a quick question to Dr. Kenton also. Uh, you know, we have got so many older men coming with uh, uh, sexual problems and somebody ordering them testosterone levels. And we know there is age-related decrease in testosterone levels. And they are very adamant on asking of testosterone replacement therapy. So what's your take on it? Um, yes. Um, actually, before I answer that question, can I make just one point, another point about where ultrasound can put you wrong in girls? So if you have um, a, a young girl who's apubertal with primary amenorrhea, the guidelines all say you should do pelvic ultrasound. I say, please, God, do not do that, because chances are you cause this enormous panic yeah. about, oh, my God, there's no uterus. Yeah, yeah. There is one just it's too small to see. So don't yeah. ever order a pelvic ultrasound in a young girl who's prepubertal until she's had at least six months of estrogen because so many, so, much, so much panic can be caused. And so many of the case reports published in terms of um, uterinogenesis and Turner syndrome, whatever, are actually probably garbage. It was just a uterus that was too small to see that was under uterine, under, 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 under estrogenized. Now, back to the, your proper question, which is in terms of the older man with, um, with low testosterone. Well, I've got a way to simplify this. We know that one to 2% um, of older men have gonadal insufficiency. Um, and by that, I mean raised LH, raised, raised um, uh, FSH and low testosterone. And about another 10% of what you might call, what's called biochemically compensated gonadal insufficiency. So um, testosterone normal range, but raised LH um, and FSH. Now, if someone's got low testosterone and raised LH and FSH, I am confident that is hypogonadism as it would be in a younger man. Where I lack confidence in the diagnosis is where the testosterone is slightly low, but so the LH and FSH. Um, and that can be difficult to distinguish between real central hypogonadism and physiological non-gonadal illness. So the overwhelming uh, amount of testosterone fall with male aging relates to the accumulation of non-gonadal comorbidities such as uh, obesity and medication. However, if you've got a, a low testosterone, even slightly low, with raised LH uh, and FSH, particularly if there's anemia, particularly if there's osteoporosis, go for testosterone. It's, 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 it's actually your safest option. I mean, what other drug? can give an older man stronger bones, stronger erections, resolve their anemia, improve their muscle mass, um, and, and reduce their frailty. So for these men, it, it's an absolutely great treatment. And, and of course, the, the male, most men they will retain the capacity to uh, lady sensitivity to testosterone into, into old age. So you know, the, the normality is, that provided you're not ill and your hypothalamus is shut down, you're going to be making testosterone to old age. Um, and so, so therefore, physiologically, there's no reason not to give an older man uh, testosterone if their testes have begun to fail. Um, and on the wards, when I'm on the wards about once a year, I'll pick up a, two men a week. So inpatients coming in with other, other diagnoses, um, I promise you I don't do a full endocrine examination, I don't examine the testes, I look at the labs, I see, ah, oh, Anemia, is there a cause? No. Check an FSH level. 
ever sexy level high half the time, uh, and then we show a low testosterone. Um, and so it, it's been said that, that, that hypogonadism is at the same time being overdiagnosed, misdiagnosed, and, and underdiagnosed. Um, and the men pushing for it aren't necessarily the ones who stand to benefit from it, although they may be the ones who put in the worst and nastiest complaints about us. Um, and whereas um, men with like frailty or osteoporosis and anemia may not care about their sexual function at that age, and therefore they may not come up with that as a positive symptom. Uh, but actually, a testosterone replacement has the potential for improving quite a few different parameters uh, for them. So um, I think we're running over time. I just need to conclude this session now, but I need to uh, pick your uh, brains about uh, uh, one thing, Dr. Quinton. And that is something that I've often thought about. And now recently, I think I've started doing it a bit more. So when you see a child who is, uh, you know, a couple of years or three, four years before puberty, say an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old, or even a peripubertal girl whose puberty is delayed or a boy, uh, uh, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism I'm talking about. So we go in with hormone replacement therapy like you've described, but I was just wondering whether giving them gonad small doses of gonadotropin injections, not the full uh, stimulatory dose, but like it normally happens that the testis does not get to the adult size just around puberty. There is a slow development that happens throughout childhood. The ovaries we cannot see. So I'm assuming that some, something similar happens there also. So what stops us from giving gonadotropin at the same time as we are doing hormone replacement? Estrogen or testosterone? Um, habit. And actually, there is one situation where I would love our pediatric colleagues to be to use gonadotropins. And this is where um, uh, a boy is born with bilateral cryptorchidism or unilateral cryptorchidism with another marker of hypoc hypoc, such as uh, they've got micro penis or they've got cleft lip or cleft palate, or they've got markers of other pituitary hormone deficiencies. What I'd like them to do is before the child gets to three months of age, the boy, do a blood test, LH, FSH and testosterone. If the LH, FSH, testosterone are not in the adult puberty range, which they should be in little boy that during mini puberty, and instead they're undetectable, at that point you've diagnosed congenital hypog hypog, and you don't need to wait until puberty. And then before you even think of referring them to a pediatric surgeon, treat them with FSH and HCG to try and bring the testes down. The data show there's 80%, actually no, 100% of cases, the testes come down. But of those that come down in about 10%, they retract to back up again. But then those cases are much easier for the pediatric surgeon to bring down because the testes are much bigger. And also you've enlarged the, um, um, the, 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 the cord. Um, and so therefore your chance of losing a testes is much smaller. So I'd encourage gonadotrophins in that situation. We just need to break the habit of electrical tourism, pediatric surgeons. Now, in terms of uh, induction of puberty, yes, yes, you can induce puberty with gonadotrophins, um, um, certain, certainly in boys. Um, the difficulty is getting them to adhere to, to regimes that, that, that they don't really un understand. Um, and, um, but yes, but yes, you know, you can do it. And I, and I, and I, I do it when the boys still cryptorchid. So it does happen that the, the boys are cryptorchid and they slip through the pediatric net. Um, and um, what I would generally do is I would get, start them to, with testosterone with some FSH for, for three months. I would then stop the testosterone, add in HCG. Um, and I'd be simultaneously taking them through puberty um, and also inducing, inducing descent of, um, of that testis. Um, and, okay. and yes, we've seen some very late descent of testes. So the same situation applies to young girls also. And, uh, you know, once you've started HRT, if you were to simultaneously be giving them gonadotrophins, what's the, what's the harm? Because when you replace hormone, you don't really develop ovaries or testes. Well, um, so the difference is this, that um, 
in first of all there's there's much less of a mini puberty phenomenon in 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 young in, in neonatal girls um, and the remarkable thing is if you compare inducing sperm production in a hypochypal male to inducing ovulation in a hypochypal female the difference is remarkable so in a hypochypal male um, you can be treating them for a year before you see any sperm maybe um, and you won't reach a peak sperm count for maybe two or two and a half occasionally three years and even that peak sperm count may be well below um, what we consider normal for, for a normal man um, and then about 10% of them well, actually 50% of them if you're electric orchid will never get sperm at all by comparison you can have a woman with Kalman syndrome um, provided you've matured her uterus okay with, um, with estrogen, literally she could have gonadotrophin injection, HMG, um, menopure, once a day for about seven days, pull out a nice big juicy follicle, inject FSH, ovulate, have sex, get pregnant, done. Um, and, and so, in a sense, you know, women are born with, with all their eggs for their life good to go, whereas um, the hypochypo male testis has to be um, fully, um, has to be developed from zero, from ground zero. So that's why I think gonadotropins are, 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 have much more promising in terms of male adolescence than the female adolescence. Um, I would say, having said things are so easy for women in pregnancy, hypochypog, Obviously, they don't need estrogen in pregnancy because the placenta makes it. But then once they deliver and they want to breastfeed, at that point, the midwives say, don't take hormones, don't take hormones. And of course, you don't need much estrogen to breastfeed, but you need some. Um, and so I always advise women, listen, make sure when you go to the hospital to deliver, you've got in your pocket some one milligram estradiol tablets. Um, and the moment you've delivered, you start taking half, half a day Otherwise, you won't be able to breastfeed. If you can get your obstetrician's agreement, great. If you can't get their agreement, you have to do it anyway. And then you carry on estrogen only, low dose, until you finish breastfeeding, after which you can convert to um, a combined HRT back again. I think I'll have to stop here now. Uh, my internet is getting worn out for some reason. I don't have very good sound quality anymore. Um, uh, as regards polycystic ovary syndrome, thank you so much, uh, Professor Lubnapal. Uh, we are again at that same position. And I think one of the, I'm just floating this idea, I've thought about it often, that maybe we should stop classifying them as polycystic ovary syndrome, but we should go from the various phenotypes and separate these girls according to their phenotype and just study them. Just study the different phenotypes, you know, hormonally, clinically, history, their behavior with treatment. And I think only then will we get somewhere. I feel that as long as we keep on throwing every, everything in this basket of polycystic ovary syndrome, we'll never really get anywhere. The one that we sort of talk about most is the original description of Stein-Leventhal syndrome, which is basically metabolic syndrome in, in a female, uh, happening in a female with its gonadal uh, um, consequences. And a very similar thing happens to men as well with metabolic syndrome and young boys as well. The rest of what is lumped into metabolic syndrome really needs to be teased out and, and seen separately. And I think for starters, maybe phenotypic separation and observing these girls in their different phenotype, phenotypical compartments might get us somewhere. So with that, um, I just have to profusely thank the two speakers, Dr. Richard Quinton, Professor Lubna Pal, and all the very eminent panelists on this uh, program on reproductive endocrinology. We could go on and on forever. This has been a very enjoyable session. I have certainly enjoyed it. Thank you very much and hope to see you all again soon. And thank you for this lovely session. Thank and thank you to all the audience as well. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate Pleasure. it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. The office.